Thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm not very good with microphones. Is that okay? Okay. Um, and thank you, Helen, for pulling us all together. It's been really a rich two days. Um, I have to start with an apology that I have to leave before question time this afternoon. So I welcome your questions and your networking, and that's my email address. Please be in touch. So here we are, Fukushima plus two. It has a beginning, but quite frankly, in the human frame, it has no end. And prevention is the only cure, to quote my good friends at Physicians for Social Responsibility, who I thank as well for this event. I want to start with some news, though. I got home to email last night and found out that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has permanently denied a license for the very first time ever. <laughs> I need to acknowledge that it's been multiple organizations, including Beyond Nuclear, uh, but Michael Marriott at Nuclear Information and Resource Service did an incredible job as lead intervener to challenge the license for new reactor construction close to Washington, D.C. So as we ended our session this morning with the view that we need to move from study to protection, I would say, and prevention. And we have just seen an amazing act on the anniversary of Fukushima by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It is an anomalous point right now, but let's see a build in that direction. That circle is empty and is going to stay that way. So I'm, I'm taking a page uh, from some of my colleagues to, to cut to the chase and get to the point. Um, I'm here to talk to you about gender, and I'm going to unfold this, but many people don't know how to read a graph. And so I want to take just a moment to return to this picture that Stephen Starr gave us yesterday. Um, I want to acknowledge Ian Goddard for creating the graphic. And this information, as we'll talk about more, comes from the National Academy of Sciences Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation 7, or BEER 7. Again, we'll get there. But, but look across the bottom. That's the lifespan, 0 to 80. We hope longer, but this graph ends at 80. And look at the vertical. That's increased cancer risk by exposure to a given amount of radiation. And I want to just say that I think that this is a little bit of a fictional story here, but it's a very important pink line and blue line. What is the blue line? The blue line is boys turning to men, turning to old men. What is the pink line? The pink line is little girls turning to women, turning to old women. And if you look at that left-hand part, that is zero to five years lumped together graphically by Ian, but it's actually a, a five-year group, and it includes pre-birth. Pre and what do we see? We see a striking difference between the blue line and the pink line. Now, Ian added the little green, uh, I don't think I have a pointer here, maybe I do. Um, anyway, he added the little green circle that's on the 30-year-old male blue line because that is what our regulators assume to be the individual who's getting any dose of radiation that we're talking about yesterday and today. All of the radiation we've been talking about assumes that is the individual getting that dose. Whereas this graph really unfolds the entire life cycle of our species if you want to take these numbers. And these numbers are suspect, but how suspect are they? Are we going to flush a 100% difference between 0 and 5, between the blue line and the pink line? Are we going to ignore it completely? And even at the point of the uh, green circle, this graph is a little bit off, I think, because there's a 50%, 40 to 60% difference between adult males and adult females. So I'm about to move fairly quickly through a bunch of pictures that are going to be very interlaced with others you've seen. Hopefully you take that as very confirmatory that we are, as a community are seeing a lot of the same stuff. Um, but I do want to just acknowledge that this level of radiation exposure is the same one that we call two REMS in the United States, that is the limit for atomic workers. And also the amount of radiation that the Japanese officials have said it's okay for school children to get while they're in school in the contaminated areas of Japan. 
not even the amount that they're getting total at home and going back and forth and playing outside, just the amount that they would get while they're in school. So it, it's called low dose. In my book, it's not very low. So that graph tells us something. It tells us that one rad does not fit all. We've known for a long time that primary germ cells in the embryo are far more vulnerable. We heard about that today. The fetus, children, their cells are dividing much more rapidly. Their bodies are smaller. Alice Stewart taught us that elders have a bump up in their vulnerability as well. Their repair mechanisms maybe aren't working as much. Some genotypes. We have a whole oncology field that's now tied to what is your DNA. And we know that some people are more likely to get um, radiologically caused cancers. And now we have to add to that list a gender difference, that females, both juvenile and adult, are more sensitive. So it matters who gets the radiation, not just how long, not just how much, not just what kind. And ultimately, I think this does raise the question of what do we mean by dose? But what I mean by being here is to stand and say, it's time to stop letting Monday be the only driver. Let's kick Wall Street out of the decision-making role. I'm being a knowledge translator. I'm being an activist. But we have to collectively, as a society, move towards prevention and precaution as the basis of policy. And I believe that means we have to get a whole lot more women motivated to get involved. <laughs> Sadly, it's too late for prevention for a lot of what we're seeing. And I think that slide that talked about cesium from the weapons test is incredibly important in this picture. But I've got to say the other names, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, weapons test, Kishtim, wind scale, Santa Susana, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Are there others that we don't even know about? This is that big release two days in between each of these reconstructions, Chernobyl, from April 26, 1986 to May 8, 1986, resulting in that 10 days in 40% of Europe having cesium contamination above the 4,000 becquerel per square meter level. And we've heard you don't need an accident. Every single facility in the nu nuclear fuel chain uh, puts this stuff out. Now we say well, you can't see radiation, but you can see radiation's harm. We've seen it a number of times. This is very high doses of radiation burn, but you can see it with a microscope. These are abnormal chromosomes. This is tissue in the lung that's being damaged by alpha particles. This is cell membranes that have been destroyed and more abnormal chromosomes. This is schematic drawing projection of several different types of damage to DNA, including the double strand that is so hard to fix and results in so many problems. We've heard it. I'm going to say it again. No safe dose. And furthermore, it only takes a single emission from a single radioactive nucleus and that hitting a single cell to have the potential for a fatal cancer. A dose so small you cannot measure it can kill somebody. Does it do it every time? Of course not. We have incredible repair mechanisms. We live in a diverse uh, series of events, but yes. One, one can equal none. It's not a folk song. EPA standards say there's no safe dose. NRC bases part 20 and Alara on no safe dose. NAS reports from year one through seven affirm no safe dose. And most of all, we've seen the data. We've seen it. So if we start with a standard man, that little green round place, uh, first the medical community was protecting itself. Then the health physicists, who was Carl Morgan standing here 12 years ago, who said we are all health physicists if we are concerned about radiation. They were sending military and paramilitary into very defined places in the Manhattan Project, into radiological zones that were small. Those standards were written for that purpose, and now they are being generalized to everybody, everywhere, all the time. And I need to draw to your attention, not that upper circle that looks so fascinating, the lower circle. The lower circle is where we see that in 100 years, we have increased the radiological experience of our species um, by 25%. 100 years ago, we didn't have industrial nuclear facilities. So that's why I can say that. 
25%. Think of other environmental uh, parameters going up like that. Now, I'm not saying that this represents reality. It's total fiction as to who's getting what. But still, collectively, our, our institutions are telling us that we've done that. Here is the picture of how it travels through our environment. And it's an honest picture because it shows the man, the standard man. And I just am bringing Rosalie in because it was about four years ago that I started getting questions in my public talks about radiation impacting women disproportionately. And I called Rosalie because I couldn't find anything about this, and I was kind of embarrassed. I was 18 years into this work, and I'd never heard this, and where did it come from? And it was Rosalie who said, well, look at this. Well, that was out of print. I called it back. She said, go into beer seven. It's not in the text. You have to look at the numbers. It's in the numbers. And so I did my own independent analysis of the famous report. And I think Steve Wynn gave us very strong cautionary words today, that this report is based largely on the Hiroshima Nagasaki A-bomb survivors. It's largely that lifespan study that he says is deficient in so many ways. It calls to question many things. But I want to point out is we're not talking only about breast cancer. When I talk about women and cancer, everybody assumes I'm talking about breast cancer. It includes breast cancer, but it is the full range of, of cancers in which these tables show this result. Those are the lifespan ones. I want to acknowledge Dr. Arjun Makajani has an uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, and he has a campaign called Healthy from the Start that's based on that lifespan uh, projection. But I spend a lot of time with this lifetime attributable risk table, and this is the one that talks about the adults. And I wrote this paper and published it in October 2011 and took it around to all the agencies and was amazed to find that at ICRP I had applause from the audience when I gave a five minute version of the paper. And they are actually beginning to work on this, oh by the way. So real people, my son, my sweetheart, me, a little girl who's gone and her friend, two guys, three girls, that's the ratio overall. Two guys get cancer, three girls. Two guys die of cancer, three girls. So why isn't it in the text of the report? Maybe it doesn't come up statistically? Well, Arjun Makajani says it does. Um, maybe there weren't enough women involved. I don't know. But uh, the generalizations about radiation are based on men. And when we take those assumptions solely, we have an underestimate of harm for women. And in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulations, that's about a 40% at least under, under estimation for the harm to women. And that means an overall underestimation of radiation harm since we're about half the population. So it could be dismissed, it could be just, oh well, we forgot about it. But we are talking about every single female on the planet and every source of ionizing radiation from what I can tell because we really haven't looked. So why not cast the net that big? We need to look. And by the way, there are now beginning to be animal studies in which these findings are also supported. Um, so I need to wrap up, but I want to mention that uh, the first big agency to put out a uh, real sort of, yeah, okay, females are more affected, is this recent report from the World Health Organization. I think it's a deeply flawed report. I don't have time to critique it, other than to point out the um, icons. The first icon below the words is clearly an earthquake. The next icon is clearly a tsunami. And the third icon is clearly a pressurized water reactor that was not at Fukushima. So uh, take that as a sign that you cannot apply what is in this report to necessarily reflecting reality. But it's an important moment where the World Health Organization is saying that there is a difference between males and females. They're saying 70% higher risk of thyroid cancer for little girls exposed below the age of, of five in that zero to five age group. So quickly, ionizing radiation comes from outside our body. I believe there's a huge difference when it comes inside our body, and the BR7 report only looks at external. This book, which we've been all talking about, um, Alexei Yablokov has been with us, uh, does factor internal exposure. There's this famous picture showing that radiation goes to different parts of our body, but the real point I want to make is that once it's in there, there's zero distance to the point of exposure, so the doses are extremely high. 
And the other thing is that external beta goes in about a centimeter, external alpha bounces off, there's zero exposure. Um, and so the difference between an alpha particle in the body and not in the body is basically infinite, uh, but when they compare it to an x-ray, it's anywhere from seven times more damaging to findings that are a thousand times more damaging. So if you're inhaling and ingesting radioactivity, um, if there's alpha particles present, they're really not reflected in the BEER-7 report. So that's another piece that we need to factor in here. Okay, wrapping up, I wanna just go to this last slide. Disproportionate harm from ionizing radiation to females raises many issues. All are worthy of engagement. There's medical questions, there's ethical questions, there's historical, occupational, political, legal, evolutionary, and policy and regulation. It's my belief that we need to protect first and study second, but when it comes to the study, there are a bunch of places we could start. Um, probably not with body mass, because zero to five age group, boys and girls are about the same. But Rosalie thought maybe it's the percentage of reproductive tissue. Someone else said maybe it's the proportion of fatty tissue. Maybe there are metabolic differences. Maybe it's selection, which is long-term environmental. Maybe it's lifestyle, which is short-term environmental. Hard to factor that last one with the zero to five age group, though. And then finally, there are animal studies that are supporting this. So protect first, study second, but as we study, this is an important question and I do not know of any major program addressing it. Thank you.